So hi, this is Mary Beth Harrison with the Dallas Native Group at Dave Perry Miller Real Estate. And today our Facebook Live is gonna be a little bit different. First of all, I hope you've grabbed a sandwich or some lunch and are sitting there and enjoying that while we're talking about all this. So today I wanna to talk about both from the buyer side and the seller side, the way to present an offer, the way to get your offer to win, um, it's, it is like we just kind of were talking about, it is a really strange market and, and I get it. I feel so bad for the buyers right now because they're scrambling for the very few listings that we have. I mean, last month we were down 52% in listings and uh, new listings coming on the market. So that's a tough one. I mean, this time last year, we had twice as many houses to sell. Now, when a new one comes on the market, it's kind of like, you know, ants on a sugar hill or something. They're just, it's, um, I, we, I just put on a townhome on, oh, I guess, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, and we have six, seven showings just today alone. So, um, so I get it, you know, I, I get the pain, both from the buyer and the seller side. It's not easy for a seller to have to be out of their home once they put a house on the market. I mean, it's the same principle. They're having to just almost run away from home for several days because I mean, five showings a day, a, a seller can't get comfortable back in their home before they have to turn around and leave again. And so many of our sellers are working from home and that adds a whole other issue to it. So, you know, so, so I, I get both sides. I, I work with both buyers and sellers. And so I, I certainly can see both sides. If at any time during this, you have a question, go into the chat bar and uh, fill out your question and I will try and keep an eye on it. I usually have someone helping me with this and looking at the chat screen while I'm talking, but I'll try and do both. I'll try and be a magician and do both today and see if I can keep up with it or just stop for a minute and check the bar and see if there's anything in there. But let's talk about this from, um, from a seller side. First of all, there is a point where you, you list the house too high. I mean, there's, I get that the market is, is really crazy right now and the prices are going above asking price and, and all of that is very true. However, what we're seeing working for the seller side is to look at the comparables and price the home reasonably well. I'm not saying to give it away. I'm not saying to underprice it. I am saying to price it at a reasonable value for your home, for the updates, for the location, for the all of the things that, that come into play when we price a home. So if you've priced it well, then let the buyer drive the price up because that is what's happening right now is you get so many buyers coming after one house on the market. Um, you know, it's a supply and demand thing. It's like anything else. If if you know lettuce gets to be in short supply, the lettuce prices are going to go up, right? I mean, it's 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 anything. It's the best toy at Christmas. I mean, think about that. Whether it was Beanie Babies or Cabbage Patch dolls or whatever is the toy of the year, I guarantee you, they're you know they're, the price has gone up a little bit to meet the demand that's there. And it's the same thing in a house right now. So for sellers, if you price it too high. We have to meet the appraisal. The bank has to give their value. So when you've priced it too high, now you stand the chance of having an appraisal problem, meaning the bank won't accept that value. And so now you have to do something. Either the, the buyer agrees to pay more or you have to lower the price down to the appraised value in order to get the buyer's lender to loan the money. Whereas if you price it really well, and the buyer drives the price up, then chances are they're going to put an appraisal waiver on there. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. So now they've waived the appraisal value and they're going to move ahead and buy this house. So you've eliminated one small sticking point in a loan or in a transaction by pricing the house well. In other words, that we can show the appraiser where we came up with that value as agents meeting the appraiser at the house, we can clearly show them why we, came, why we came up with that price. So from a seller's point of view, pricing the home well is the first step. 
Second step is making that house look like a little model home for that long. If you can just give me about two or three days of, of a model home, I know it's hard to live that way. I call it sleeping dressed because you get that call going. Someone wants to see your house in 30 minutes, you know, so I, I get it. Um, I've, I've had a house on the market myself, and I certainly understand the pain of that. But if you can give us this beautiful home, well, you know, put together clean, closets cleaned out, garage looking good. I mean, all of it, just that it's just a, a wonderful experience to show your home that a buyer can walk in and, and feel themselves living in your home. I guarantee it's going to go pretty quick right now. Uh, and at any time, honestly, I don't think this is, yes, this is a very different time, but I'm for my whole career, I've pretty much been if it's priced right, if it looks good, it's gone and it's gone in a pretty short period of time. Uh, right now, that time is shortened even more than normal. But uh, but in a typical market, 30 days, 30 showings, you should have your house under contract if it is priced right and looks good. And even homes that need work, that's not a problem. I mean, we all get that. There's always that original owner lovingly cared for hasn't been updated since I don't know, 1970. I mean, I don't know, but you've got, you know, the green kitchen or the or the different color carpet or wallpaper or whatever. That's okay because again, priced right, it will sell. Anything will sell. Priced right. Even a weird location next to a freeway or whatever. I mean, think about it. Someone lives in every house on every corner of every street in America, right? So someone will buy that house at the right price. So uh, it's something, I, it's, it's a real sticking point, no matter whether the house needs work or is in tip top standing at attention 2021 standards, meaning the right colors, the, the granite or the, uh, the, the, the countertops, the everything, the wood floors, all the things that buyers look for in a newer or updated home, right? So, and, and think about it, that is what you're competing with is new construction. Maybe not in your neighborhood, maybe there isn't any new construction in your neighborhood, but if that buyer's been looking at new houses, then they know what a 2021 house looks like, right? They know the updates, they know what they're looking for in a home. And so they're looking to your pre-owned home with the same eyes. So, but yours is furnished and that's really cool because they can imagine themselves and their furniture in there. So look at your house through the eyes of a buyer, seller. That's all I got. It's what I usually tell them. Go stand out on the curb and look at your house and how does it look to you? And those little things that bug you all the time that you just kind of look by and just keep looking at and looking at and you don't do anything about, I guarantee you if they bug you, they're going to bug a buyer too. So those little things might be worth getting it fixed. So let's jump over to the buyer right now. Uh, buyers, it's it's a seller's market. There's no doubt right this second. And and I'm and it's that's true all over the United States. I don't I don't know many states that I've heard of that aren't having the same kind of market that we are. Um, and and I, I can see why it happened. Um, so many people either refinanced and their and their payments are now where they want them to be. And they're thinking, you know, why should we move now? We've we're happy in our house, we've redone our house, whatever that is. And a lot of people did redo their homes while they were inside all the time during COVID. They definitely did uh, redo their homes. So it's like, okay, you know, we finally got it like we want it. Why should we move? I get that. Um, so, and to the fear of where are they going to go? So here's where you as a buyer come into that play. So you find a house you want and you're willing to pay whatever over asking price, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, whatever. It's, uh, there've been some amazing offers on some of these houses. So understand that sometimes 5,000 over asking price is not going to do it. It's, uh, sometimes it will. But if you know, if, you're, if your agent has spoken with the listing agent and they know that they have other offers, then you know you're already, you're already in that pile of, of offers. Um, and something I often say to my buyers when they look at a house and they go, you know, we want to go home and think about it. Well, let me tell you, you're going home to think about it 
Someone saw it yesterday, thought about it overnight, and is writing an offer today. So you may not have the luxury of being able to think about it for 24 hours. And I know that puts you in a tough position. I get that. But that's the reality. You may not have the luxury of waiting to put in an offer the next day. Typically, agents will put out a notice saying, I want all my final and best offers by a date. And so that helps all of us a little bit to know how much time we have to get our offer in. But not every agent does that. Some of them just take the first two, three offers, four offers, or work the first one because it's a really good offer. Why not? I mean, we don't need 20 offers when the first one was really good. So, you know, I get that too. So buyers, here are a few things that can make your offer look a lot more attractive than anyone else's. First and foremost, you have got to have a pre-approval letter from a lender, not just pre-qualified, which means I made a phone call, I gave them my social security and they ran their credit. I can breathe on glass and I can get a loan. That's what pre-qualify says. Pre-approve says I have given the lender everything they need to make a decision. So the two two twos, as I call it, the two months of tax of uh, of uh, bank statements and two tax returns and two pay steps. So um, and they may need other financial if you have other financial things in your life, they would need that too. But at a minimum, that's pretty much what they're going to need. So you have given all that to them. They've approved you to buy a home for X number of dollars. And now you need a house to go with your loan rather than we found a house and now we need a loan. Mm -mm, can't be that way anymore. We have the loan. Now we need a house. Totally different totally different. But really, quite frankly, I don't care if you're buying a house five years from now. It's the same principle. You you need to know that you can what you can afford. And it's it's really funny because <laughs> what you can af what you can afford or what you're comfortable affording and what your credit score looks like, maybe two different things. I mean, there's sometimes these lenders come back and go, well, you can buy a house for five hundred thousand dollars. You're like, whoa, wait. <laughs> Who's going to pay for that? That's I'm, no, we're not. We can't do that. Uh, so just know that you can take what is your payment, what com, what payment are you comfortable with, and turn that into a loan. So let's say you wanted your payments to stay. Let's do something stupid like a thousand dollars a month, which is never going to happen. Uh, we couldn't find a house for you, but let's just say you wanted your payments to be a thousand dollars a month, and that equates to a loan of say let's just make easy right now, $100,000, and you've saved $20,000 to put down on a house, then we need to be looking to buy a house for $120,000. So you can approach your, your loan many different ways. You can start with your payments and work your way up, or you can start with your $300,000, $500,000, and then turn that into what's that going to be with your payments for the month. So different ways to do that. But bottom line is, as a buyer, you have got to get with a lender and figure out what you can afford and a letter that goes with that that says this buyer is pre-approved. We have all the documents we need to make a good decision, and we will loan them this money. That's what the letter needs to say in their words. <laughs> so, so then as a buyer, let's say you're renting and hopefully you are because you become a very flexible buyer right now because these sellers don't know where they're going either. They can't go look for a house until their house is sold. For the most part, people need to sell this house to buy this house. That's just the way it goes. And that's the whole point of home ownership is that the equity in this house allows you to move up to that house. It's the whole point of home ownership is that homes ap appreciate as they as you live in them. And so we use one to buy another. So as a buyer, if you're renting and let's just say that your lease is up June 30th, let's just throw that out there for right now. So you have the flexibility. You're willing to break your lease and close sooner and move sooner. However, you have the flexibility. So when you're writing this contract, Let's just say you go ahead and close on May 30th and you get, or May 15th, and you write a lease, a seller's temporary residential lease is what it's called. And it allows the seller to be a tenant in your home because you've now closed and you own it until 
X date. So the way you might write that in the lease might be with 15 or say you need 30 day notice to, to give your apartment, whatever you need. With 15 day notice from seller to buyer, seller may choose the termination date of this lease not to exceed June 30th, because that's when you have to be out of your apartment. So you can be flexible with those kind of things. There doesn't have to be a finite date when you have flexibility like that. And I guarantee you the seller will be so happy with that because it allows them to, to know they have their money on May 15th and they have all of that time to go find a house and move in. So you've bought them that time. And the longer, the better. Um, lenders don't like to see more than a couple of months worth of a lease back because you become an investment buyer. And that's a whole other, <laughs> it's a whole other webinar one day. But you become a very flexible buyer. So take advantage of that. Don't wait until just before your lease is up and then start running around and looking for a house. Typically, it takes about 30 days to get a home closed. It can be done quicker, no doubt. And especially if you've done your homework and you've been pre-approved, all your papers are with your lender, you might be able to close in 15, 20 days. That's possible. But most of our sellers right now need a little bit of flexibility. Uh, some of them will even tell you in the write-up that the seller has to stay, say, through the end of school year. So they don't even want to move till, say, June 15th. They want the kids to graduate or get through with their school year and then make that move. So, so again, you become a perfect buyer if you have that flexibility. So use it. Use it to your, to your advantage. And sellers, don't be afraid to demand that. Don't be afraid to say, I absolutely do not want to move until whatever, June 15th, June 30th. I've got one that doesn't uh, can't move till July. Their job starts the 1st of August and they don't want to move until towards the end of July. So it, it's just everyone has different needs and don't be afraid seller to express those needs and expect to get it. Um, that's not, not hard to imagine right now. Uh, so back to the buyer, what are some other things you can do? You can offer to pay title policy, which very often is a seller expense in our area, but take on that expense. Um, if you've gone over asking price, there's an addendum that we have that deals with the appraised value. So what it's saying is that we realized we went over asking price. We realized that we paid probably a little more than the appraiser is going to find, and we're willing to pay that money. So again, let's just take that easy $100,000 house we talked about that doesn't exist, I don't think, anywhere. But let's just take that $100,000 house, and let's say that you came in at $110,000 to buy this house. So what you're saying is that we can get a loan for the $100,000, and we are willing to put up out of our own pocket that additional $10,000 on top of the closing costs that you're going to have because you have your down payment, you have closing costs, you have other costs involved when you buy a house and your lender should be talking to you about that. So this says, look, we've saved up enough money. We're willing, if, the, if this house does not appraise for $110,000, then we're willing to come up with that additional $10,000 to get us to closing. Now, here's the cool thing. Let's say mom or dad or grandma wants to give you a gift. Uh, I want that grandma and mom and dad. They're going to give you a gift of $10,000. Well, that's okay. And, and the lender's okay with that as long as they know where that money came from. So they want to make sure that grandma or mom and dad didn't borrow the $10,000 to give you the $10,000. That somewhere along the line, someone had the money. So that's just one of those things. You have the right as a buyer, whether you're FHA, VA, or a conventional loan, you have the right to pay the additional money. I guarantee you the lender's gonna to wanna to know where that money's coming from. That, that's really an important question that you'll need to answer. So that's, that's how that works. So you've put an addendum in there that says, look, we know we paid over asking price. We probably paid over the appraised value based on everything our agent showed us, but we're willing to pay it. Those are two really important things that have come up on our contracts lately 
that we're seeing in multiple offers is buyers paying the title policy and they're agreeing to pay whatever the appraised value comes up to, not to exceed your 110,000. Granted, the house appraised for 120,000, that's not like you have to pay that additional money. That's just a good day for you because that means that that house appraised and you can get the loan and everything's good. So a lot of little tricks to the trade right now that as a buyer makes you a really viable, good buyer. But one of the important ones is really that flexibility in, in letting the seller stay in the home for as long as you can let them stay. And most people are doing that as a free lease. In other words, you're not making them make a payment to stay there. Now, that's a little hard to swallow sometimes. But again, on top of the 110000 that you came up to, or maybe the 105000 you came up to, that lease equals another what, $1,000 a month? So now you've increased the value, but you did it without uh, adding value or adding to the loan. So that's another way to look at it is allowing them to stay for free. Well, here's a cool thing for the buyer. <clears throat> Let's just say we close the house on April 30th. You won't make a payment until June 1st. So you don't make a payment in May. So you get a month there. So you're allowing them to stay and you didn't have to make a payment either. So it's a little bit of a, a benefit to you to where you're not out money only to allow them to stay for free for a month or whatever. After a month, yes, you're starting to make your payments. <clears throat> if you do put rental in there, then I usually just put PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance. So whatever your payment is as the buyer is what you're asking the seller to pay in rent is whatever you had to pay. So many different ways to write an offer. Um, I will tell you ex an experienced agent is really important right now to find. Um, it's, it, it's not that, I mean, we were all new one day. I, I get it. We were all new, but Brand new agents have never been through this type of a market. And, and it's not an easy one. I, I It's all about how you write that contract. It is, that's everything as to whether you even get to, uh, as I say, come up to bat. <laughs> you don't even get a chance to be, to even be considered. As far as the seller or the listing agent, same principle. You know, new agents have never lived through multiple offers. And when I say multiple offers, I'm talking 20, 30,000, 20 or 30 offers. I mean, it's, it's been crazy on some of these, some of these houses. Um, the first thing as a listing agent, you want to create a, an Excel spreadsheet or some kind of a spreadsheet that you can put all of the offers on a level playing field so that a seller can look across and see who's offering what, what is their loan? Is there a loan or is it cash? Um, did they put an appraisal clause in there? What kind of loan is it? Is it FHA? Is it VA? Is it is it a conventional loan? What what is it? Um, and so all of those things go into this sheet. When does someone want to close? What's the lease back? All of those things are written on an on a spreadsheet to where you can sit down with the seller and just look at everything at one time. Sifting through 10, 15 pages of a contract is you just can't do that when you've got. 10, 20, 30 offers at one time, it, that's just too difficult to be shuffling through papers to try and find the same thing for each of them. So I find putting it on a spreadsheet that we created years ago, because this is not the first time we've had a multiple offer situation um, in the market. Uh, as with any, again, as I said at the beginning, as with any good house, if it's priced right, if it looks good, it's gone. And multiple people will want that house. And so um, this is not our first rodeo to come up with multiple offers, uh, but it is our first rodeo to have to have it be on almost every transaction. That that's the hard part right now. And buyers, I get that you're writing four, six, eight offers before you get one accepted. I get it. And, and I feel so horrible because you get excited, you, you love this house, or you wouldn't put an offer on it, right? So, you know, you're, so the disappointment is huge when, when you don't get the house. And, and that 
hurts us as well. Believe me, we get invested in these houses just like you do. So it it's painful for all of us to um, to get down the road like that and 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 keep going to the next one and to the next one and to the next one. But you quickly learn what makes an offer work or what gets an offer accepted versus another. And, and, you know, there's always going to be, you know, it's like I say, there's always that kid on the block that's faster, smarter, prettier, whatever, right? There's always going to be that offer that just goes, wow, they were willing to go that far over asking price. That is crazy. And it is, I, I, I be the first to tell you it is, it's, it's, um, it is just that. It's just like, wow, they went that far over asking price to get this house. That that That's just insane. So I I understand that you're going to, you know, it's the old, you're going to kiss a few frogs before you find your prince. It's the same principle that uh, you may lose a few before you get to the one that you get accepted. But the longer you're in this game, the more you understand uh, no matter what your agent says, you'll quickly get it yourself. What you have to do to get this to get this to work. So um, the cool thing is, uh, among other ideas, is let's just say on this hundred thousand dollar house, you were willing to put down twenty percent. You had the twenty thousand dollars that you were willing to put into this. Well, let's say you did get it at two. I mean, at one ten that that this house you wanted to buy it and you wanted to come up with the additional money. Well, what the lender can do is just take that 20% down, take it down to a 10% uh, down payment, take the additional 10% and apply it to that overage. So there's, there's some things to be done here that are creative that allow you to get into a home for a little more than maybe what you wanted or what you thought, um, there's just some creativity there between your, your realtor and your lender. Um, there needs to be some, um, some good conversation and, and working with people that you know is, is huge right now. Um, I Being able to work with lenders that we work with all the time, that we have great communication with, that we, um, that we can work together to figure out how to make this work for the buyer, that's, that's just priceless. And so that is another thing that I throw out for, you know, for what it's worth is if your realtor suggests a lender, you might want to talk to them just because they've got a relationship and things usually don't go awry because they don't want to disappoint us. I mean, we, we give these guys a lot of business and so they don't want to make us too angry because... <laughs> That just doesn't go well, right? So, um, so working with someone you know is really it, it's it's a big deal. It's helpful for you. It's helpful for your your realtor to help you get it through all of those things. Um, and quite frankly, when you're delivering your offer to the listing agent. As a listing agent, I look at who those lenders are, and if I know that we've had trouble with lenders before, uh, sometimes our big banks, you know, just get to be a little problematic. So when we see two offers that are very similar, but one is a real, is an agent that I know and, and a lender that we know, that goes a long way. And so, um, you know, whether that's fair or not fair, it's just, it's just the truth. So if we know we've got someone that we can depend on and get the job done, <clears throat> something you have to think about. So those are just a few things from the buyer side that you can do to make your offer stand out over everyone else's offer. And then seller, um, you know, it's a little bit of a crapshoot because you decide to work with contract A and midway through they back out. I mean, that's just that's just the way our market is right now sometimes. And one other thing I want to tell the sellers right now, too, is um, if you have your house pre-inspected, which I'm a big proponent of, and we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. We've got an inspector on, uh, on our call in a couple of weeks that you don't want to miss because that is a wealth of information. But if you have your home pre-inspected, meaning pre-listing, before you list it, you have the home inspected and fix whatever you want to fix 
um, or not, and that's okay too. The buyer's buying with some knowledge, but it, it eliminates the biggies, the things that scare a buyer, things like air conditioning, foundation, roof, uh, water heaters, big electrical problems, plumbing problems, those kind of things. If you know before you list it that these are issues, then get them fixed, you know, stop that conversation so that when the buyer has the house inspected, those things are fixed. They're done. They're, they're off the table. And furthermore, would you have ever negotiated down to know you needed a new heater or new air conditioner or a roof or one of as I call the biggies? No, you would have never negotiated down if you had known that. So knowledge is a, is a huge thing. So if the house is pre-inspected and you know pre-listing inspection, I call it pre-listing, pre-inspection, pre um, is you, you, you have the knowledge as a seller, what you're willing to fix, what you're not willing to fix, but what's going to come up and kind of bite you. Because I tell you, when the buyer does that inspection, um, there are things that just scare a buyer. And, and, if, and if the list is like a laundry list of things that are wrong, then the buyer kind of goes, whoa, wait a minute. I, I, you know, I don't want this house. There's too much wrong. And, and now we've got a scared buyer. And so if you can get ahead of that game as a seller, I think that's just a wonderful thing. If you just get the house pre-inspected and you know, you know what to expect from your inspection, right? Um, and you can go along through that, through that uh, inspection report and write repaired, replaced, whatever. So you have your seller's disclosure and you have this listing, uh, this uh, inspection, and you give them to the buyer. So the buyer's buying your home with more knowledge than any other house they're buying it. And I just think that's a win-win for everybody, both for you, the seller, and for the buyer with knowledge. So, um, so a lot of times these buyers are, are putting these houses under contract so fast because things are moving so fast. And then they get into it and they're like, oh, you know, now that we've really thought about it, we don't want this house. So just because you got an offer and chose it does not mean it's necessarily going to make it to the finish line. Um, that's just like I said, that's kind of a crapshoot. That's just a matter of we chose you and we hope that you're going to make it all the way through to closing. But there's no guarantees. There's no guarantee about anything in this world, but there's no guarantee about that either. What about working another one of those offers as a backup? Ah, so now what that says, if contract number one terminates or goes away, contract number two just immediately slides in and becomes a real contract. That's a really smart thing to do is to go ahead and work the other one of your other multiple offers as a backup. So it reads just like you want it to read. The buyer either agrees or doesn't agree and moves into a backup offer. <clears throat> so there's some there's some validity to doing that as well. So just something to think about as a seller is that maybe you accept contract number one and you back it up with contract number two as a backup offer. So talk to your agent about that. And uh, and that's always, you know, that's always just a smart thing to kind of keep in mind. I'm going to take a quick look and see. I don't think we have anything in the chat room. If you all have any questions that you want to ask, please jump in the chat room and we'll um, and I will try and keep an eye on that. Um, so uh, the main thing at this point in life with this market like it is, is first of all, if you're thinking about selling, don't think much longer. It's this is this is the most opportune time I could ever imagine to put my house on the market. Um, frustrating, but a good time to be doing it. And as a buyer, don't get so frustrated that you get out of the market. <coughs> excuse me, because interest rates are where they are right now. I don't see them going down. They're only going to go one way, which is going to be up. So that takes away your buying power. Uh, a lot of our buyers got frustrated last year and just said, you know what, we don't want to deal with this anymore. We're just going to get out of the market for right now. Well, those people who got out of the market a year ago, interest rates are now a whole point higher and house prices have gone up exponentially high. And so now it's, you know, where they were able to afford a $300,000 house, now their buying power has gone down to $250,000. So I know it's frustrating. I get it. But to get out of the market right now, mm -mm, I don't know that that's, 
the smartest move. <laughs> I, I just I just don't. Uh, I think that you've got an opportunity of interest rates and prices that we know where they are right now. And um, from every economist I've spoken with, we we see this market staying this way well through the summer. And so, um, you know, I don't I don't see that that's going to change. If anything, we might see rates jump up a little bit. I don't know that either. I, I had a crystal ball, but it broke. And, you know, now what are you going to do? <laughs> so I wish I were clairvoyant enough to be able to say this is exactly what's going to happen on this date. <laughs> this is what you can look forward to. But unfortunately, I'm just not that good. <laughs> so uh, but it's something to keep an eye on. And because every time the interest rates go up, you lose a little bit of buying power because now your payment's gone up accordingly, right? And we've talked about that with some of my lenders when we've been on calls with them. Uh, I think this is my first day to not have a guest with me today, which is so weird. But anyway, um, just it's um, it's definitely something to consider is what your buying power is right now. So I hope a few of those tips helped both, both the seller and the buyer. If you have any questions, certainly reach out to us. Uh, you can go to our website at dallasnative.com and we will answer questions or you can find them on our on our website. We've got all kinds of stuff about Dallas there. So uh, you certainly can have a wealth of information, but certainly reach out to us and ask the question. Um, I've I'd be glad to certainly be glad to help. So uh, if you have any other thoughts about things you'd want to hear about on our Facebook Live, please let us know. Send that to us as well. And any questions that you may think about after you've listened to this, be sure and reach out to us. And uh, thanks so much for listening today.